It is now time for our questions. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, Premier, when uh, the Teacher of the Year can't get a job because he finds himself 800th on the seniority list as a result of the new Liberal hiring policy, Regulation 274, wow. doesn't that tell you that something has gone badly off the rails when it comes to teacher hiring in our province? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Education will want to comment in the supplementary, but um, I just want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for raising the issue. I know that it is, is of concern, and we have heard those concerns, absolutely. Uh, I know that the, uh, the Minister of Education has got a working group in place to look at what changes we might be able to make. And uh, so we're open, we're open to that, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Absolutely. And we've said all along that uh, as we've heard these concerns, we're taking them seriously. Seriously, and we we want to uh, do what we can to make it right, Mr. Speaker. Do a supplementary. <clears throat> well, um, Premier, it's it's not time for another committee. It's time for some action. Uh, th this is this is pretty basic. It's it's very straightforward. I mean, we all care as as parents. I know uh, you do. You want to make sure that your kids and now your grandchildren will have the best possible teacher in the classroom. Uh, my daughter Miller has been blessed to have that. Um, my dad. Uh, retired principal, and I spoke to my dad about this, and he'd always look for the, the teacher who's going to bring the most to the job, the right qualifications, they're going to coach the hockey team, uh, do drama, uh, they brought life experience to the table. I had a lot of confidence in principals as a parent They make the right decisions for the school. This is the way it's always worked. Under Regulation 274, under this Liberal government, under your leadership, that's been tossed out the window, and now they're hired on the basis strictly of seniority. Clearly, as a parent and a grandparent, you would agree Question. that this is not in the best interests of our kids. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And, you know, I haven't seen the proposed bill, so I, I, I don't know exactly what it will say. But, um, but it's really important to me and to us that, that Ontario's teachers have a fair and consistent hire, hiring practice and process across school boards, Mr. Speaker. That kind of consistency and that kind of predictability is very, very important. Last year, we heard from teachers that that wasn't the case, and the reality is that um, you know the, the regulation ensures that teaching candidates are chosen by a number of criteria, not just uh, seniority and they can go beyond seniority, but I to go back to my original comment, I recognize that there are concerns, Mr. Speaker. I recognize that there may have been an overcorrection in terms of some of the issues that had been brought forward. That's why there is a working group in place, the Minister of Education, and we are open to making changes. We acknowledge that there are concerns, yes, and we will, we will do everything in our power to make sure that we get it right, Mr. Speaker. But, but Premier, again, I, this is not a time for, for waffling. It's not a time to uh, study the issue. It, it's a time for action. I, I, I've, I've yet to find a person, aside from maybe a, a, a teacher union head, who thinks that this is appropriate for our kids. Let me, um, let me tell you a bit about Jason uh, Trin. Jason Trin's a kind of teacher my, my dad would have hired at Lakeshore Catholic. And I do want to say, Speaker, that school celebrated its 25th anniversary this past weekend, a school my dad began in Port Colbert Lakeshore Catholic. I'm proud of that, and I'm proud of what he did. And he hired teachers then that rose up the ranks. Some became principals themselves, vice principals, leaders. Minister of the Environment, come to order. Jason Trin was an, is an impressive young man. He has his master's in molecular biology. Mr. Rural Ontario, He was Ontario actually given the, the Premier's order. New Teacher of the Year Award for what he did to inspire in his students a love for science. That brought in a, a new camp as well to get kids to improve their grades in grade nine testing. So. Why is Jason Trin 800th on the list? Shouldn't he be number one on the list? Won't we want that quality in our classroom? Thank you. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And, and we, Speaker, we absolutely agree that it is important to have excellent teachers in our classroom. And that's exactly what we, we will do. But I think it's also important to understand that we have thousands Order, of young teachers out there who want jobs. And it's not fair to the old young teachers out, who are out there and want jobs, and perhaps to older teachers who have re recently qualified, if we don't even post the job. We need to have some sort of process 
where when there is a position available that the job is posted and there's opportunity for interviews so we can select good teachers now are there some problems with the regulation yes we, we've heard Answer. problems too, and that's why there's a working group, that's why there's a study, and that's why I've committed to the sector that if they can Thank find you. a solution. Thank you. I, I dare say I dare say that in a classroom somebody given an answer would not be allowed to be shouted down. New question, the Leader of the uh, Opposition. Um, uh, back to the Premier, if I could, uh, Speaker, on, on the same topic. Um, Premier, the, the Minister of Education says we need a good process. Clearly, the process should be the best person gets the job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it makes sense. It, we, we've, all been, we've all been inspired. We wouldn't be here in leadership positions as MPPs, as one of the, the, the lucky 107 in this place. We weren't inspired by a teacher. One of mine was Mr. Comar at Notre Dame College School in, in Welland. Now, now, don't go after Minister Mr. Comar. The environment will come me. to order. I love order. economics, maybe some of the questions I asked today. But if it wasn't for that kind of inspiration, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. And you want to have these types of teachers in our schools. Experience, of course, but also passion. How are they going to help out the kids in the schools? Are they going to contribute to the extracurricular activities? Howard Goodman, a trustee with the Toronto Board, raised another issue about Regulation 274, saying Question. it unwittingly puts those diverse new rookies at a disadvantage. He references a Vietnamese school where a teacher who speaks Vietnamese could help a lot of these kids is sidelined because of your seniority hiring process. We do the right thing. No studies, no delays. Thank you. Just end this odious practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, as the Minister of Education has said, I think that the Leader of the Opposition would agree that not even having a job posted is not a Remember fair from practice. From Speaker, will come so to there order. are obviously changes that needed to be yep. made. And the fact is that we are, we are open to making changes. We recognize that there are concerns, and we will work with the sector. And as the, uh, as the Minister of Education said, come to some consensus and, uh, and implement those changes. That is what we've committed to doing, Mr. Speaker. But I, I have to say I'm really glad that the Leader of the Opposition is asking a question about education. Exactly. In his white paper on education, 10,000 education workers would be fired, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to suggest that if 10,000 workers out of the education system were fired, fewer kids would get extracurricular activities, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Fewer kids with special needs would get support, Mr. Speaker, and the system would not work as well in the best interest of students. So I'd ask him how, how he sees that as in the best interest of the system. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you know, um, obviously the Premier hasn't taken the time to read the white paper because it's all about what's best for our kids, raising standards in the classroom. And, and clearly, if you, want to, if you want to raise the standards in the classroom, you want to make sure the best possible teacher is there with our kids each and every day. And let, let's, let, let's call it it's straight here. You, you caved into the teacher unions, and as part of that process, you handed over the keys to hiring to the teacher union bosses. I think that's, that's wrong. When I asked my dad how he did this, he said, well, basically, they'd post the job. They would probably get hundreds of applications. They would shortlist. A committee, usually the principal, the vice principal, the department head, would interview the best candidates. They'd winnow it down to the best list, and they'd hire the best teacher. And the school was recognized and celebrated and grew as a result of that. Other principals say the exact same thing. So, Premier, if you, if you admit Question. that your system has problems, why continue it for a minute more? Why keep Jason Trin and excellent teachers on the sidelines? Why don't you just end Regulation 274 now and stop Thank this you. mess so our kids can get ahead with the best Thank skilled you. educators? Thank you. Stop, stop, please. You see it, please? You see it, please? Premier? Mr. Speaker, I want it. I want it. Uh, as soon as I'm ready to sit down, I don't want you to continue. And the member from Stormont's not helping things, what I'm trying to explain. As soon as I sit down, don't start up. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I want to just draw attention to, again, uh, one of the premises underneath the, the question of the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, and that is that somehow working with the education sector, working with the organized teachers in the sector is not a good thing. And I think we need to pay close attention to that, Mr. Speaker, because that underpins the philosophy of the Leader of the Opposition. The, to work in a collaborative way, to find common ground, to work with the people who are in the classroom and who, who are part of organizations is 
not the way that he would work, Mr. Speaker. And so getting rid of 10,000 teachers, cancelling full-day kindergarten, that is the track that the Leader of the Opposition would put us on. That's not what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. We are seeing advances in our schools. We want a fair and consistent hiring practice, and we're open to, open to changing that uh, regulation, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. I, um, I, I think this is instructive, uh, Speaker. Uh, when the time came to choose between the wishes of the teacher union bosses and what's best for our students, the, the Premier has sided with the union bosses. I, I don't think that's helpful to our kids. I, I've not talked to a single person, and I've talked to a lot of people about this. Uh, people are very concerned. We care about how our kids are going to do. We want the best of the best in our classrooms with the kids. It should be based on their skills, their determination, their contribution to school, not if their pets of the union bosses are highest on the seniority list. Now, Premier, if you won't act, we will. My colleague from the PN Carl Lisa McLeod is bringing forward a private member's bill today to get rid of Regulation 274 and restore what has made our schools strong in the past that rewards decisions by principals and that rewards the best possible teachers. So if you won't do it, we Question. will. I'll ask you this. Enough consultations, enough committees, do the right thing and support Lisa McLeod's bill later on this afternoon. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So let me just be clear. On this side of the House, what we support is publicly funded education. Increased funding, Mr. Speaker, in the education system has gone up 44 per cent since 2003. There are 13,300 new teachers in the system, Mr. Speaker. Kids' test scores are up. Graduation rates when we came into office were 68 per cent out of high school, Mr. Speaker. Now they're 82 per cent. Kids are doing better, Mr. Speaker. We have one of the finest education systems in the world. Improvement. Regulation 274 was put in place because there were concerns about the consistency of the, of the hiring practices, Mr. Speaker. It may be that it was an overcorrection, and it may be that there need to be changes to it, and that's why the Minister of Education is prepared to make those changes, Mr. Speaker. But make no mistake, public education is is advocated for by this government, Mr. Speaker. We have strengthened the education system, working with the sector. The, the party opposite, Mr. Speaker, would undermine that success and would fire people. Thank you. Start the clock for a moment. You see it, please? I'll take the back. You see it, please? When, uh, when my memory is working, I will make this comment. I'm, I'm going to ask the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke to come to order, and I'm going to ask the Minister of Rural Affairs to come to order, and that's the second time. New question, the member from Bramley, Gore Moulton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, yesterday in the House, the Minister of Finance echoed claims by the insurance companies that they've enjoyed very minimal profits. The Minister said it was a fact that insurance companies are receiving about 3% in their ROE profit margins. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier stand by this claim? Yep. Mr. Premier. Minister of Finance. Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member opposite uh, from, from that bench talked about the ROE. We uh, are trying to express and, uh, and make note of the fact that uh, the ROE if we were to take the uh, return on premium, that which was calculated in Alberta, for example, the premium, the uh, return on premium in Ontario would actually be at five to six percent, which is the lowest in any province in this country. Two supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. An independent report written by a longtime insurance industry actuary, prepared for today's auto insurance hearings, actually shows the industry had, in fact over a billion dollars of profits last year and that the ROE calculated would be something in the range of 14 percent. That's four times higher than what the minister claimed yesterday. Is the premier ready to admit that they may be wrong about the actual profits that the insurance industry is making? Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, I've just explained that there's a great difference between this ROE calculation, which we've already advanced and told the FISCO that on, a, on the rolling scale we want to reduce. It is a formula-based system, and we expect the rate to fall further. But let's be clear, it's the difference between the ROE and the return on premium. And, the, and it doesn't seem, and I appreciate that there's misunderstanding over there because it's a complicated initiative and it's a complex issue. We understand that. But we will continue to say that we've, uh, we will review, we're over 
overhauling the formula further to make it more transparent for all drivers. But as I've stated, uh, when you compare Ontario to the rest of Canada, the return on premium versus, for example, in Alberta, in Ontario, it's five to six percent, which is lowest anywhere in the country. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, we, we, we know, Mr. Speaker, that we're paying the highest rates in the in the province in the country, so that's something we need to fix. It seems like this government is ready to break speed records when it comes to helping the insurance industry, but they slam on the brakes when it comes to helping our drivers in this province. Over the past five years, the industry has enjoyed billions in dollars in savings due to auto insurance reforms. The government has already taken out billions in costs from the system, but for drivers, the rates continue to climb. Salil from Mississauga watched this summer as his rates increased by $500 to over $3,000 a year. That's with no new claims, no new car, and no accidents. The minister simply got his facts wrong, and now the government has a choice. Will they stand up for drivers who deserve a break, Question. or will they keep helping the insurance industry maintain their record profits? Uh -oh. So, Mr. Speaker, the third party has started talking about this, and they've been talking quite a bit in the last number of months, but we on this side of the House have been taking action on this for the last two years. As a result of these actions, that we're able to now pass on savings to consumers, and we will continue to do so. It's not something that you flip a switch and it gets done. It takes a lot of work, and it's taken a lot of years to make it happen, and we are seeing some results to that, and we'll continue doing what's in the best interest of the public. And yes, we all need champions, and we need champions on all sides of the House to work together to make this happen. We will do our part, and we'll continue to lead. Thank you. No question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, people, have elected, people who have elected us have told me they want us to work hard for them, and they want us to deliver results that makes their lives better. For example, reducing auto insurance rate. Can the Premier tell us how many people she's met with that are concerned about the plight of Ellis Don Corporation? <laughs> Premier. <laughs> Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I, I appreciate the member opposite asking a question. Uh, uh, Speaker, labor relations is uh, having stable labor relations is always the cornerstone of our government. We have worked extremely hard uh, over the years uh, since coming into office in 2003 to make sure that we have uh, balanced and stable labor relations. And that's why, Speaker, I'm really proud to say that uh, we have a, a, a situation in Ontario that 97 percent of uh, labor agreements are, are achieved through collective bargaining, which is a tremendous success uh, in terms of the effectiveness of our labor relations agreement, and we'll continue to work with all political parties and our labor partners uh, to ensure that that, uh, uh, that trend uh, continues to progress. Thank you very much, Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, the question was to the Premier, and it was a pretty simple one. Can you tell us who's been lobbying you to get this piece of legislation passed? And all we get is what you're trying to do. I'm going to ask you the question again. It's a very simple question. Can the Premier tell us who's been lobbying you to fast-track this legislation that's going to benefit but just one company in this province, Ellis Don? Thank you, Minister. I think, I, think, I think the member opposite knows that the bill he's referring to is a private member's bill that was brought up in this House and it's been debated and was passed uh, through this House. It's obviously up to, uh, up to committee hearings, which is up to the House leaders to decide whether that process will take place or not. Uh, so I think it will be uh, fair for me to comment on a private member's bill, but of course we listen to all interested parties on issues that are important uh, to all Ontarians. The focus of our, jo uh, of our job here in, uh, as a government, and the Premier has spoken about this often, is to grow our economy, is to create jobs, to make sure that hardworking Ontarians have opportunities across the province uh, to, go, uh, to meaningful, good-paying jobs, Speaker. Here, here, here. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, the only thing that appears to be growing is the coffers of the Liberals and Tory party. <laughs> so I ask the question again. Your government is about to embark on a programming motion with the Conservative Party to fast-track a piece of legislation that's going to benefit one company in a sector. So I'm going to ask you the question again. Can the Premier explain to us how you end up putting this piece of legislation as priority and how and who has lobbied you? Yes, sir. 
Madam Speaker, again, as, as you know, this is a private mem member's bill that was brought forward by the official opposition. It's been debated uh, through this House and, and, and passed. Uh, of course, this is a minority legislature, so we have worked with all political parties to, to make sure that the bills that, uh, that are important to Ontarians are passed through this, uh, through this legislation. I thank the NDP for being big supporters of a lot of the very important legislations that we have passed through this House, including the budget bill that is making life uh, affordable for everyday Ontarians every single day. So we look forward to working with all political parties to make sure that we are growing our economy in this province and creating a good paying jobs for all Ontarians. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Energy. Good morning, Minister. Uh, your ministry has been given the draft Oakville gas plant cancellation findings from the Auditor General. The previous auditor told us Mississauga was turned over six to eight weeks in advance. Your people have it. Somebody's got it, Minister. Will you tell this House what it cost to cancel the Oakville gas plant, or will you continue the long line of Liberal operatives who have dodged, deleted, and distorted the facts? You told us Mississauga was $190 million to cancel, but the auditor told us the truth. It was $275 million. You stood in this legislature and told us it was $40 million to cancel Oakville. Would you care to confess this number this morning, Minister, before the Auditor General spanks you down again? Question. Minister of Energy. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, before the uh, Auditor General's report on the Mississauga uh, gas plant issue, uh, the member from Pembroke, uh, Nipissing, uh, stood in the House and he made the same accusation to me at the time that we had the report. My answer at that time, Mr. Speaker, was no, I'm not aware that the ministry has a copy of the report. I have not seen a copy of the report. I will await the Auditor General to present the report. That's the fact, Mr. Speaker. So I'm going to ask the opposition party to stop making accusations that are speculative, that are unfounded, that demean the credibility of people on this side of the House. It's a disgrace. Thank you. Uh, speaker, let me tell you what is disgraceful. Minister, you, your deputy, the OPA and the IESO have all missed the September 12th deadline to turn over thousands of documents to us. If one of you is late, that's one thing. But the fact that you're all holding back tells us someone has invoked the cone of silence. Do we need to bring another contempt motion to find out what you're hiding this time? Didn't you learn anything over the last year? Why won't you tell us the real cost of cancelling Oakville? I know why. Those missing documents will tell us why. Will you turn over the files today, or are you going to let this Premier repeat history, throw you under the bus with you found contempt of this House? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is a matter that should be dealt oh, this should with be by right. the committee, but if the honourable member wants to bring it to the floor of the legislature, then I will answer it. The simple fact Those is that North the Bay. committee asks the Not good enough. Carry on. The, the committee asked the Ministry and the Ontario Power Authority to undertake very, very extensive searches for the documents. Mr. Speaker, the, both uh, organizations have been forthcoming in the past. My understanding, Mr. Speaker, is they have spent over a million dollars in the searches they have already done for the committee, and they are still, Mr. Speaker, in the you process of the following up on the most current answer. request. They have been in communication with the committee. They have outlined the steps they are taking, Mr. Speaker, and they are working round the clock in order to produce the documents that the committee has asked for. Mr. Speaker, there have been tens of thousands of documents provided by this government, and I think, Mr. Speaker, this is a matter for continual discussion. Thank you. New question, member from Trinity Spadina. My question is uh, to the Premier. The government's Condo Act Review Panel released its uh, second report yesterday. There's some progress, but for condo owners looking for a quick and cheap way to settle a dispute, the recommendations come up short. The report sets up a condo office to uh, hear disputes. If it's a small matter, the case goes to a quick decision maker 
and it gets settled. So, so far, so good. But if it's a big matter, then it goes to a dispute resolu resolution office. Lawyers are welcome, and all you get is an assessment, no settlement. And if your dispute is with a developer, the report says the present model works reasonably well. In other words, you're on your own, and good luck in court. This process continues to work well for consultants, lawyers, and developers, but not for condo owners. Question. Will the government put condo owners first? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Consumer Services is going to want to comment on the supplementary, but I just want to make a comment because I want to, first of all, thank the member opposite for raising this, is this issue. It's something that many of us, I would say all of us in, uh, in government, hear about the concerns of condominium owners and in that sector the need for changes to the Condominium Act. So I'm very pleased that the uh, member opposite raised the issue. I'm very pleased that we have had the opportunity to put in place a very innovative, I would suggest, and comprehensive consultation exactly. process because it's complex. It's a complex issue, how the, how the Act should change and what's in the best interest of the people who live in all of our constituencies in condominiums, Mr. Speaker. So I'm very pleased that that process is underway, and I look forward to working with the, uh, the member opposite exactly. to get some resolution for condominium right. owners. Speaker, the report says condo owners should pay a levy of up to $36 a year to support the condo of, uh, office, plus user fees. With 600,000 condo units, this office would cost condo owners over $21 million a year. This is about the same net cost as the Landlord, te landlord Tenant Board. But when you go to that board, your disputes get settled quickly and cheaply. This condo office settles the same, the small stuff but for everything else, it's just, it just adds a new process. And when it's over, you're still looking at mediation and arbitration, and then the courts. If condo owners must pay the same cost as the Landlord Tenant Board, shouldn't they get a condo tribunal that can settle all their disputes like the Landlord Tenant Board? Question. Thank you, Speaker. I, too, want to thank the member opposite for the question. I know he's a strong advocate for this file. And uh, I'm just very pleased to also inform the member in the House that stage two of the condo report review was released yesterday by the Public Policy Forum. And I was absolutely thrilled to attend the residents' panel final meeting this past weekend, where they endorsed in large measure this concept of a condo office. I know the member is talking, opposite talking about uh, some sort of tribunal. The notion of a condo office, as recommended in the report, is to address dispute resolution and many other aspects of condominium living, such as education and training, potentially licensing of property managers. So I think uh, it's important that we all have a look at the report. It's up for a 45-day uh, review by the public. I'm very uh, pleased that so many stakeholders, condo owners, residents, lawyers, stakeholders have Answer. been involved. Thank you. Thank you. And the question, the member from Ottawa South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the, ministry, the Minister of Immigration. Ontario represents the largest uh, francophone community outside of Quebec. In my rating, we have the largest uh, community, francophone community in Canada. To celebrate Franco-Ontarian culture. This week-long festival is one of the largest of its kind. Through live music, street art, and dance, this festival celebrates the more than 600,000 Francophone community members living across this province. I was pleased to recently learn about a new website funded through your ministry providing French-speaking people around the globe about the information about the benefits of working and living in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could you please tell us more about this great new initiative from our government? Here, here. Minister, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want, to, uh, I want to thank the honourable member for his question and once again congratulate him on his recent election to this House. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, at the Ontario Association of Francophone Municipal Conference in West Nipissing, I announced that our government is making it easier for municipalities to meet demographic, demographic challenges and attract skilled Francophone newcomers to help grow their communities. The new Francophone Municipal Immigration Information Online Portal provides detailed information and tools to help attract Francophone immigrants and help build and help them settle here in the province of Ontario. 
This new web portal was built in partnership with 18 municipalities across this great province, and through the portal, we're also helping Francophones in Ontario make online connections to find jobs in their communities. Here, here. This initiative, Mr. Speaker, will help us meet our 5% target for Francophone immigration laid out by the Ontario Immigration Strategy. The development of this portal is part of Ontario's $1.3 million investment in the Municipal Immigration Information Online Program, uh, referred to as MEAL. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Uh, this is a great initiative that will help our Francophone communities flourish. I know this will make a difference in helping municipal municipalities attract skilled Francophones to meet the needs of their community. Mr. Speaker, as we know, Ontario has a rich Francophone history, which helps make Ontario a vibrant cultural mosaic that it is, mosaic that it is today. The Francophone en Ontario represent the Francophone in Ontario represent 4.5 per cent of the total population in Ontario. The Frank Franco-Ontarian population is very dynamic. Since many years, we have uh, welcomed many uh, immigrants from uh, North Africa and Asia. I ask to the minister other measures of, of his ministry do what to support our Francophone communities. Again, I'd like to thank the member for his question and his championing of the Francophone culture here in this province. Our government is committed to achieving the goals of the immigration strategy, and one of them is being to position newcomers here in the province so that they can be successful. Uh, specifically, we're investing in French language services for newcomers because we know they need these skills to succeed in the, in the new work environments and better integrate into their communities. In addition to tuition-free language services, in 2013-2014, our ministry has doubled its support to Francophone settlement service providers. Some key services that we help fund here in the province are settlement counselling, guidance, assistance with immigration and transition issues, translation, workshops, and a broad range of settlement-related issues. We want Ontario's Francophone newcomers, current and future, to succeed, and we know we will strengthen Ontario's vibrant communities and help contribute to our province's economic prosperity. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question? The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Speaker, Speaker uh, to the Minister of Health. Just after midnight uh, on August 29th, Thunder Airlines, under contract to Orange to provide air ambulance service, was dispatched to pick uh, to Janicum First Nation. That was a code four. When that crew landed, an Air Bravo aircraft, also under contract to Orange, was already there with two Orange paramedics. Two Air Bravo could not transfer that patient because the satellite telephone was not functioning. The patient, along with the Orange medics, were flown to Thunder Bay, where the patient was eventually then admitted. The delay was extensive. Is the minister aware of this incident, and can she tell us what the outcome was? For Question. Thank you. Mr. Health, long term care. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, Speaker, and uh, I can tell you that uh, Orange is committed to providing the highest possible quality of care in Pakanjikum and elsewhere across this whole province, Speaker. I can tell you that the new leadership in Orange is really focusing on uh, measuring and improving the care that they provide. Uh, and I, uh, I can assure you, uh, Speaker, that every effort is made to provide the highest quality care in every case. Thank you. Supplementary. Apparently the minister knows nothing about it. I can tell the minister that that patient died. I can also tell the minister that it's alleged that the reason that the Air Bravo satellite telephone was not working is because Air Bravo had not paid its bills. Wow. I can also tell the minister that the CEO of Air Bravo admitted under testimony last week that the company was having serious financial difficulties. I can also tell the minister that Orange failed when issuing a contract to Air Bravo to conduct any financial inspection of that company to determine whether it had the capacity to deliver. I'd like to ask the minister this question. Wow. After everything we have heard about the lack of oversight on the part of the ministry, 
on the part of Orange Question. over the work that has to be done to deliver safe, secure, reliable air ambulance. Why, over these number of months, do we still have to hear Thank about you. incidents like this? Uh, speaker, I know, uh, I know the member opposite would be interested in hearing some of the, uh, the quality metrics and the results uh, at Orange. So, Speaker, from January to March this year, Orange pilots were available to respond to calls 97 per cent of the time. Orange aircraft were in service 99 per cent of the time. Orange paramedics were available to respond to calls 95 per cent of the time. 96 per cent of patient transports between health facilities are confirmed within 20 minutes. 90 per cent of, of Orange's patient transports from emergency scenes these are confirmed within 10 minutes. Speaker, Orange is focusing on measuring the quality of care. Uh, the nature of the work in emergency medicine and emergency services is there Answer. will always be cases, Speaker. What's important to me is Orange, the, under the new leadership of Dr. McCallum, is measuring and reporting on quality metrics. That's a big change. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, leading up to the Pan Am Games, this government made a regulation under the Private Security and Investigative Services Act that effectively allows security guards to act as police officers until March 31, 2016. This regulation didn't come to the House for debate, but instead was quietly filed in the Gazette, much like the laws enacted during the G20 fiasco in Toronto in 2010. Has this government learned nothing from the G20 about the consequences of enacting secret regulations? Minister, will you explain to Ontarians why this regulation to give security guards the same duties as police officers was passed in secret and without appropriate Question. public input and debate? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. I uh, wanted to uh, thank uh, the uh, member for her question. As uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, the uh, safety, health and safety of those athletes and those uh, who will come to the Pan Am Games in 2015, we wanted to ensure that they will be safe, that uh, the athlete will have a wonderful experience. And uh, so we are, as uh, we speak, and we have been for some time, we have a committee that uh, has put, uh, been put together, headed by the OPP, to make sure that uh, the, uh, the athlete and the, uh, the uh, people who will attend uh, the, uh, the game will be safe. I have the full confidence that uh, this, uh, this group is working well together and will make Answer. sure that uh, you know, every uh, safety measure will be put in place for the safety of all of those who will Give. come to the Pan Am game. Thank you. Speaker, after what happened during the G20, Ontarians are rightfully concerned about the potential for serious civil liberty abuses when those responsible for security are not fully briefed on the limits of their powers. The changes proposed to prevent the abuses that happened during the G20 in Toronto are still being debated in this House. In the absence of new legislative protections, how will the minister ensure that the appropriate training and safeguards are in place to prevent security guards from misinterpreting their newfound powers during the Pan Am Games so we can prevent the kind of civil liberty violations we saw during the G20? Thank you. Minister. This, is a, this is an excellent question, and yes, you know, we will be hiring a security guard and they will be under the direction of the police. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we have added in the, in the uh, contract that uh, they will have to hire new grad, new uh, security guard from our colleges. So this is part of our youth uh, strategy, you know, for, to, to find jobs for our youth. And the number one priority will be that these security guards will be well trained and they will know exactly what, what will be their responsibility. 
And you know, there's nothing that has been passed in secret. You know, regulation don't come to the house. And this has been posted yes, on their website for 30 days. And uh, so we uh, we have been very clear, very open. We have a lot of the police, uh, the police force that. Thank you. Your question, the member from Oakwood, just mark them. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier and the Minister of Agriculture and Food. Across the province, people are very excited about the government's local food strategy. In my great riding of Oak Ridge's Markham, we are fortunate to have so many opportunities sh to shop for local foods. The Holland Marsh is right next door, and the Stovall Market and many other farm markets offer the chance to purchase local produce and support local producers. I know that the budget includes a commitment to develop a local food fund. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Agriculture and Food please update the House on this commitment? Great question. Thank you very Minister much, Mr. Agriculture Speaker, and thank, and thank you to the member for Oak Ridge's Markham for this question. And I think that the, uh, the issues around local food are of concern to everyone in this legislature, Mr. Speaker, yeah. and they are issues that are very important to the agri-food sector. But, Mr. Speaker, they're important economic issues because the reality is that a local food initiative can spur the uh, the agri-food economy, can help expand the agri-food economy. And Mr. Speaker, I was very pleased to join uh, folks at Food Share last week to announce the local food fund. It's a $30 million fund, Mr. Speaker, Fantastic. that over three years will allow for investment in the kinds of initiatives that will raise awareness about local food and will actually help farmers, Mr. Speaker, and help food processors to be able to find markets to expand their businesses, Mr. Speaker, and we know that if we support uh, Ontario farmers, if we support yes, Ontario food processors, Mr. Speaker, that's it's good for people's nutrition. It's good for uh, for the food that we eat across. The, uh, good for us, uh, what we eat, but it's also good, Mr. Speaker, for local and regional economies. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Premier and Minister of Agriculture and Food for the update. My constituents will be excited to hear that our local food fund is now up and running and that your ministry is now accepting applications. In my community, the local food movement is strong and consumers flock to our farm markets. I'm fortunate enough to represent a riding that has both urban and rural roots, and I know that my constituents will have questions about the fund. Speaker, can the Premier and Minister of Agriculture and Food provide more details on the fund and the type of projects it aims to support? Tomato. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the, the member from uh, Oak Ridge's Markham comments on the rural and urban nature of her riding. And I think that one of the things about this discussion is that we are so interconnected, Mr. Speaker, and the notion that somehow rural Ontario and urban Ontario are separate entities is just not the case, Mr. Speaker. And my colleague, uh, the Minister of Rural Affairs, talks about One Ontario, and that is exactly the case, Mr. Speaker. We are One Ontario. So the local food fund is designed to help producers, people who run restaurants, Mr. Speaker, and other interested parties, to support regional and local food networks, to enhance technologies and capacities in order to be able to grow, to provide minor capital in order for businesses to be able to grow, um, to foster research and best practices and share those best practices, and, Mr. Speaker, to invest in education and outreach so that Sir? everyone in the province understands how local food can be accessed and why it's so important Thank to do so. Thank you. Your question? <laughs> Member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. More than five months ago, we learned that the A.O. Smith plant in Fergus would cease manufacturing, putting 350 people out of work. I called upon the government to help our community with training and economic development support. And in response, the government promised an action centre to support the displaced workers and help them find jobs. That action centre is having an open house today. Finally. Will the minister explain to this house why it took him more than five months to open an action centre to help these A.O. Smith 
work. They're over Minister Training College Universities. I'm, I'm happy to, Mr. Speaker. We respond within a matter of hours when these when these layoff notices are given. We we respond by by contacting the municipality, and we did in that case. We've been working very closely with the mayor and the municipality. We respond by contacting the employer. We respond by contacting the, the workers and their representatives. And Mr. Speaker, we don't take unilateral action and step on the toes of all of the other people in those local communities. We work with them. So there are times, Mr. Speaker, when, when our intentions or our offers to set up things like an action centre are, are taken into consideration by those on the ground locally uh, and, and implemented in the, in, the, in the time that meets their, uh, their needs. That's the case here. We're always Answer. there, we're always available, we're always ready to respond, and we'll work with that community as best we can to respond to this challenge. Minister, don't you dare blame my constituents for your own delays. That is totally unacceptable. In 2005, eight years ago, and before the recession hit, I called upon the Liberal government to have an all-party committee of this legislature investigate our industrial competitiveness with a view to developing an action plan to protect manufacturing jobs in the province. The Liberals' inaction and indifference have directly contributed to the loss of 300,000 manufacturing jobs in this province. And even when a plant like A.O. Smith closes, displaced workers wait more than five months for the support that they need. The Premier now says that she will focus on job creation and the economy. In light of their disastrous record on jobs, how can the people of Ontario see any light at the end of the tunnel as long as these Liberals remain in power? Thank you. Minister. Mr. of Economic Development, Mr. Speaker. Mr. of Economic Development and well, uh, Training Employment. Mr. Speaker, I, in fact, take offence to what the member opposite just I think we've started shouting people down again. I uh, will talk to the member from Renfrew and Nipissing Pembroke in a calm manner and tell him this is not enough. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think I have to repeat that I take offence at what the, what the member opposite has just said, because he knows well the number of conversations that the two of us have had, not just specifically about A.O. Smith, but also the fact, the announcement, the efforts that I've been making in terms of meeting with, repeatedly with the local leadership, with the businesses in the area. I've been working hard with the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. In fact, we've made a number of announcements that directly and positively impact the people in the area and the people that are affected by the closure in, in the Fergus plant. I met at AMO, I met with the local leadership as well. I think he should talk to the mayor because she is quite satisfied with the efforts that this government is making to address the issues with AOW Smith as well as the job opportunities and job challenges that are faced by the local leadership there. So, and, I, and he knows well, Answer. he knows well the efforts that I've been making and the announcements that we're hoping that will come forward in the foreseeable future that will benefit the people in that important part of the province. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. <laughs> this Liberal government is so focused on sticking Ontarians with the bill for more transit promises in the GTA that it seems to have forgotten that commuters depend on buses and trains to get them to work in regions like Niagara, where I live. It's bad enough that the Conservatives in Ottawa have slashed our via rail service in our community. But it's even harder for the people who live in Niagara to understand why this government keeps wavering on the GO train service. Why won't the government publicly commit to a date, year-round, all-day GO, to St. Catharines and Niagara Falls and stick to it? So, Mr. Speaker, I am, I am absolutely committed, and we have expanded GO service across the GTHA, Mr. Speaker, and the member opposite knows perfectly well that we have done that and that we have expanded GO service into Niagara. The reality is that the member opposite raises a very important issue, and that is that we need to have an integrated 
transportation plan that includes the federal government, the provincial government, and municipal governments. Because the service that the member opposite references was was at the federal level responsibility, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is that I have at the Council of the Federation, I have made it clear with my colleague premiers that in order for us to have a coherent transportation network across this country, Mr. Speaker, we need the federal government to work with us. In the meantime, we will continue to expand Go Service as we've been doing for the last 10 years, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, Niagara is filled with bedroom communities. People make a conscious choice not to move away from Niagara. They want to live in where they want to. They want to live where they live, and they need uh, transit available to them. Crowded buses and intermittent train service is taking a toll on the quality of life for people who live in the Niagara region. The government keeps saying that it's going to put in this GO service all day, but it never mentions when. Will the minister tell Niagara residents today when they will finally get the promise of daily GO train services they so badly need? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I appreciate the uh, member opposite advocating for her community. And my experience when I was Minister of Transportation, and I know there are other ministers of transportation who can attest to this, that whenever we make an announcement about increased GO service, there's a brief moment of that's great, and then the next expression is when can we have more? Because it is in such demand, it is such a good service, it provides such convenient and efficient transportation options for people. So GO is committed to two-way all-day service, Mr. Speaker, on all corridors. The implementation is underway, Mr. Speaker. We know, we know that there is increased demand for GO service, and that, Mr. Speaker, is, from my perspective, indicative of the culture shift that's happening in this province. People are looking at our uh, finite resources and saying, you know what, we need to find ways to get out of our cars and get into transit. That's why we're committed to building Thank this you. infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, and expanding service Thank across you. the GTA. From Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government Services. I receive calls and inquiries from constituents on a daily basis on a variety of issues, including on access and services provided by the provincial government. My constituents are hardworking men and women that lead busy lives, commuting to and from work, taking care of young children or elderly family members are their priorities. Spending time to try to locate government services that they need should not be time consuming. Providing efficient and e easy access to government information and services has been a priority of this government. Last year, the Commission on the Reform of Ontario's Public Services provided recommendations on more efficient methods of delivering services that Ontarians need and want. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please tell us about the ongoing work to fulfill this government's commitment to delivering Thank services you. more effectively to all Ontarians? Minister of Government Services. Good question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, the member is quite right that uh, people with their busy lives uh, are looking for convenient ways to deal with the government and particularly to access uh, a variety of services. Uh, Service Ontario has as its mandate to uh, try to make as convenient as possible for people to uh, deal with those services. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, this morning I announced uh, a new measure that's being brought forward by Service Ontario, the fact that uh, people can now uh, renew their driver's license online. Oh, it's simple great, matter great. of going to uh, our website, uh, serviceontario.ca, and they'll be eligible to uh, renew their driver's license. Now it's once every five years. This you can renew it once and will only have to go every 10 years in order to get an up-to-date photo. Mr. Speaker, this uh, new service has been added to more than 40 services already available Answer. online, including birth certificates, marriage certificates, license plate stickers, and driver abstracts. Again, Mr. Speaker, it's a way of making people's lives easier. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is good to know that True Service Ontario and it, an initiative such as the online driver's license renewal service, we are delivering on our commitment to making it easier for Ontarians to access the services they need where and when they need them. 
The people of Ontario expect their government to deliver quality services, including a range of services, access options. In my riding of Scarborough Rouge River, it is important that there is a driver in every household. At times, driving to and from a location is the only option. Spending time to renew a driver's license can be time consuming. We should be taking steps to helping people getting that done faster and more efficiently. My constituents will be glad to know that they can now renew their driver's Sam. license online. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he please inform this House on how the online driver's license renewal services expedites the process? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Uh, each year in Ontario, some 1.6 million Ontario drivers uh, renew their driver's license. And through this service, uh, most eligible, most of them will be eligible to do it from an internet site in their home or elsewhere. Eligible uh, drivers uh, will be able to go online, and the uh, slogan we have is just click, renew, and drive. Uh, after that, a new driver's license will be mailed to the applicant and will be valid for five years. Ontario drivers who renew online will only need to go to a Service Ontario Centre every 10 years, as I mentioned previously, to have a new photo taken. Drivers will be notified if they need to go renew their license in person because they have reached this uh, time frame. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. New question, member from Halliburton, Fourth Lakes Block. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. The MNR recently made changes to the Endangered Species Act, which streamlined a number of provisions in the permitting process. That is why I was surprised to read the EBR posting for Woodland Caribou, yet another job-killing posting for Northern Ontario. It's very clear from the proposals in this posting that the socioeconomic analysis was never done to determine the impact which they would have on a northern municipalities, forestry, and a wide range of stakeholders. So would the minister explain why these critical factors have not been taken into account before your ministry decided to kill more jobs? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And the member opposite uh, knows full well that the uh, government's position on this has been one of finding a balance to ensure that jobs in northern Ontario and throughout the province would be able to continue to thrive. I categorically reject the assertion that this is somehow outside of the regular process. The member uh, introduced the private member's bill some time ago to, in fact, gut the legislation, which is not something on this side of the House that we're prepared to do. We wanted to find the balance. We've struck the uh, appropriate balance. We formed a committee. We had ample input from countless stakeholders. And what I can tell you, uh, Speaker, is that uh, the uh, various groups and organizations are very supportive of the changes we made. Tom Loggren said the proposed regulations provide some of the much-needed balance in the implementation of ESA in the forestry industry. Russ Powers, the Association of Municipalities, he said the streamlined approach balances protecting Thank endangered you. species with other priorities. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I categorically reject that you care about jobs. <laughs> Your ministry has failed to perform a socioeconomic analysis, which my party would make mandatory. Some of those municipalities who will be impacted are doing their own analysis. And in an August 13th letter to the Premier and to you, the Town of Cochrane provides a detailed analysis of the impact which these proposals would have on the Abitibi River forest. MNR proposals would require sacrificing half of the entire forest volume, which would be catastrophic. The impact on communities from North Bay to Hearst would be a loss of another 8,000 jobs, 433 million in lost wages, and a loss of 273 million Question. in lost taxes for the municipalities. 8, Minister, will you show that you care about the North and its people and withdraw Thank the Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member opposite does. You see it, please? You see it? We need quiet. 
I mean it. The member from Durham, come to order. And you're not supposed to be talking, Minister responsible for seniors. Answer, please. Thank you, uh, Speaker. The member opposite knows, and, and she's referencing a uh, plan from Cochrane, uh, Mayor Politis, who's the Conservative candidate, so I, I uh, take that with a grain of salt. But what I will say, Speaker, is that Jamie Lim, the president of the OFIA, here's what the forestry sector says, Speaker. Key component of the proposed legislation is the recognition by the government that forestry activities already provide for the protection of species at risk with regard to the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. She says, while well, also ensuring that economic development activities such as forestry will be allowed to proceed without unnecessary impacts. It's quite clear that the forestry industry supports the changes we've made, is very clear about that, and the yes, plan sir. that we have uh, proposed, Speaker, and has, have implemented clearly recognizes that balance. I am somewhat concerned about the position of the NDP because Thank you. the opposition seems to be. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to uh, wish you a good Frank Ontario Day. It's a, a day to rend, uh, give homage to the past. Yeah, and I have a question for the Premier. Today, uh, Frank Ontarians in Southwest, particularly young people, ask how many, how long will they have to wait until they could continue their studies in French. They have the right to have access to education in French that people in the north and the east or in the Greater Toronto area have. In its report of 2012, the Commissioner to French Language Services said that access to post-secondary education must be given. It's only zero to three percent that's almost non-existent, the access to, uh, to that education. Will, will the government will offer uh, a college for Southwestern French youth? Thank you very much for the question. I spoke with students who have a need to have education, a post-secondary education in the Southern Ontario. And it's a, a concern. We don't have enough programs for the students, and it's very important that we have the programs. It's also important or necessary to have another building. I'm not sure it's something that we have a discussion on it. But for me, it's very important that we have the appropriate programs for students in the north and in southern Ontario. Thank you. Question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's easy for a government in a Franco Ontarian day to say nice words, to say uh, we, to celebrate culture in French, and to have uh, education programs. But um, measures are stronger than words. Up to now, the government has done very little to offer uh, post-secondary education in Southern Ontario. The Commissioner for French Language Services offered solutions, and the NDP went to various communities and in the Legislative Assembly and offered proposals as well. Maybe, Mr. Speaker, maybe they don't understand. But my question is simple. When will the government will offer enough programs for post-secondary students and university students in the southwestern Ontario for Francophone students? Le ministre de Collège et Formation. We've been working extremely clo close with, uh, with RAFO, who are the Francophone students' representatives across this province. Uh, they've had an opportunity to meet with myself. I know the Premier has talked to some of those students ac across the province on many occasions. Minister of, uh, Minister of Francophone Affairs has been an incredible champion of this. We're not just talking, Mr. Speaker, we've taken action. One of the things they asked for was an enhancement of our travel grant to ensure that Francophone students uh, can get a, take advantage of that grant, even if there were services available within some of their communities. Uh, the, that group of students was extremely pleased with the measures we've taken. But I can assure the member, as I've said to, uh, to uh, Ray Fo for the great work that they've done, 
uh, that we're working very closely with them and we're looking to move very quickly. It is in our throne speech. Answer. We're going to take action to help ensure that Francophone students get greater access to Francophone courses in southwest and central Ontario. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of Mr. Nackley for second reading of Bill 21, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000 in respect of family caregiver, critically ill, critically ill child care and crime-related child death or disappearance leaves absences. Uh, call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
The members take their seats, please. Members take their seats, please. Steve's ready now. It's okay. You go ahead. I'm going to make them wait. <clears throat> On March 18, 2013, Mr. Nackley moved second reading of Bill 21. All those in favor, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Malloy, Mr. Malloy, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Garrison, Mr. Garrison, Mr. Jeffrey, Mrs. Jeffrey, Mr. Souza, Mr. Souza, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Madame Mayor, Madame Mayor, Ms. Sandals, Ms. Sandals, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Ms. McCharles, Ms. McCharles, Mr. Quinter, Mr. Quinter, Mr. Bartolucci, Mr. Bartolucci, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Duguid, Mr. Duguid, Mr. Gravel, Mr. Gravel, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Ms. Peruzza, Ms. Peruzza, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Leal, Mr. Leal, Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Jassin. Ms. Jassin. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Mangat. Ms. Mangat. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday. Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willette. Mr. Willette. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jelina. Madame Jelina. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Miller Hamilton A. Stanley Creek. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Bantoff. Mr. Bantoff. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Well done. Now, those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 94, the nays are zero. The ayes being 94 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Shall the bill be ordered for third Mr. reading? Mr. Labor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Report to the Standing Committee on General Government. Great committee. So ordered. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.